Hey guys, welcome back to Maple Syrup Tech. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at the Rate Spire coolers that come with the new Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5 series. We're going to try to answer the question, how good is it actually when we compare it to really budget aftermarket coolers? So basically, first of all, one thing too that I want to start out by clearing up is it's way better than what used to come with the AMD series. For any of you out there that have never seen it, this is what you used to get with the FX CPUs. This one was the one that came with my FX 6300. So it's a tiny little chunk of aluminum with uh, you know a tiny little fan. So first of all, I want to really give props to AMD, showing that you can include a decent cooler with your uh, processors that even allow you to do a little bit of overclocking and you don't necessarily have to charge a huge price and you don't necessarily need to piss off your partners either. Reason why is because anyone who really wants to overclock is going to buy an aftermarket cooler anyway. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, we won't need the FX process cooler anymore. We're going to look at the AMD coolers. First of all, I want to look at uh, basically the uh, visuals. So one thing I would that honestly AMD went out in as well my cooler is more specifically the LED edition because it came with my Ryzen 7 1700 and honestly AMD has made a very nice looking uh, stock cooler. Like I'm not saying it's going to win against a LED uh, AIO or anything like that but in the looks department out of these three coolers that we have here AMD takes the cake. So uh, first of all we're going to take a look you should see on the screen right now a visual of what it looks set up with the LED uh, cooler and even the Spire without the LEDs on is actually a really nice cooler when you're looking at it from the top. Uh, next you can see here the other one the first cooler we're going to be comparing it to is the Cooler Master Hyper T2. Now this is not the 212 EVO like I said my, the point today is I really want to compare it to the most budget coolers I could find. So this is the Hyper T2. It only has two copper pipes and the fan is a 92 millimeter fan rather than a 120 millimeter fan. And secondly, as well, uh, basically this cooler goes for between 10 to 15 bucks on average. If you're paying more than that, you're probably overpaying for it because if you wait for any type of sale, you can get this between 10 and 15 bucks. So it's a tiny investment. And before it would, you know, in the time of the FX series, it would still get you some, you know, beginners, overclocking for your CPU if you were really on a tight budget. So you should see the visual on the screen now, see what it looks like in the case, nothing too fancy. Uh, you know, honestly, the visuals are not that nice for the Hyper T2, in my opinion. Uh, the second cooler we're gonna be comparing it to is the Deepcool Gamax 300. Once again, there are cheaper coolers from Deepcool, but it's pretty much they're entering the, the entry level for a standard sized cooler. And once again, it's in the same price range. It's between ten and twenty dollars. This one you can you'll get on a regular price at twenty for twenty dollars. You'll find it on sale more for fifteen. If you're really lucky, you can find it for ten, like I did. But uh, you know those sales come along every now and then and are not at all vendors. So the deep cool, honestly, for the price you're paying, I find the visual with the blue fan is a step above the uh, Hyper T2 from Cooler Master. And you're getting a full uh, 120 millimeter fan. Like I measured, it's 120 millimeters. It's round rather than square, so it's, it, it doesn't have. I, I find the visuals are a lot better. And to begin with, it has three copper pipes rather than two. So for the same money, you're actually, in my opinion, it you know just by looks overall, and we'll see the numbers in a few seconds. It seems like we're getting a more substantial cooler from uh, Deep Cool than we are from Cooler Master. And you should see the visuals right now on screen, see what the Cooler Master looks like set up. Nothing too special from the top, but like I said, if you have an open window case, seeing the blue fan in there, depending on your color scheme, it can actually make decent sense. With me, it's, in gr it's a green color scheme when I was doing this testing, so it wasn't too, too, uh, didn't fit too well, but still I found the visuals were better than the Cooler Master uh, overall. Now, if we get to performance, we're going to start by looking at idle temperatures and uh, the graph should be on the screen right now. As you see, the winner of the idle temperature is actually the AMD Ryzen Spire. However, I want you to take that with a grain of salt. The reason why is because there's a phenomenon when you compare a, a tower style cooler to a direct 
you know, on the uh, on the CPU cooler. It's that basically tower coolers, uh, the way they work is that basically you have a liquid in the pipes that basically travels up the pipe, dissipates, and then basically comes back down in pipe. When I say travels up, it's because it becomes steam or it becomes uh, a gas form. Comes up the pipe, it comes up the pipe, dissipates into the cooler, and once it's uh, cool enough, it turns back into its liquid state, comes back down and back and forth. The reason I'm explaining that is for tower coolers, you're probably always going to get a lower performance on idle, uh, unless you're looking at a really high-end tower cooler. Reason why is because, and you can do the test yourself, while it's running on idle, only about the first third of the stack is actually warm and actually being used because you're not even getting enough heat for the liquid to fully travel up and get full advantage of the cooler's full uh, fins and uh, its full stack. So I, I, you know, the idle temperatures anyway are not the most important, but nonetheless, it still shows that AMD is, is delivering a solid product with their Ryzen Spire. You're getting pretty low idle temperatures, even when you compare it to, uh, you know, base, uh, you know, aftermarket coolers. So um, now we're gonna get to the real interesting part. We're gonna look at uh, basically low temperatures. So the graph should be on the screen right now. Uh, if you see low temperatures, uh, just so that you understand, basically I'm using uh, IDA64. So what I do is I run IDA64, I wait 15 minutes timed. And then what I do is since Ryzen is a little finicky on temperatures right now, is that I note the temperatures over a five minute period and I make an average. The reason why is because Ryzen right now, the temperatures like fluctuate almost every second. It's not like in previous processors well, where you'll hit a steady temperature. It'll always be fluctuating a couple of degrees. So to be fair with all these coolers, that's how I did it is I ran IDA64 for 15 minutes. Then I took the temperatures on over a five minute period and averaged it out. And basically, uh, I'm gonna, pr if you haven't noticed already, all the temperatures are also in delta temperatures. So what that means is it's the difference between the room temperature and the temperature of the cooler. So even as the room was getting hotter, it'll still be representative in the numbers because I'm removing basically the temperature of the room in there. And as you see, in the, uh, for the low temperatures, however, uh, the Hyper T2 and the Ryzen uh, Spire actually performed are almost identical, which is once again, really props to AMD. So basically in the box, you're getting the equivalent of what you had to pay between 10 or 20 bucks before uh, in, you know, from Ryzen coolers. So honestly, it's a really good news for any of you wanting to buy a Ryzen out there because it really means that you can do some basic overclocking just with the basic Ryzen Spire. And you don't necessarily need to invest if you're happy with what you get from the Ryzen Spire. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it also means that don't waste your money on uh, necessarily coolers that are too budget, unless you can find a reviewer like me or other people on YouTube who've actually tested it out and that you see that the performance is above the Ryzen Spire. And I'm specifying this as budget coolers. Because if you take something like the Hyper 212 or any other uh, high-end cooler, I'm guaranteed you're going to get better performance than the Ryzen Spire. And the reason I, I'm not looking at those temperatures, people have already done it online. I have an AIO on my Ryzen 1700, so I know you're getting better temperatures from high-end gear like that. You don't, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's self-evident. We did, I didn't need to do the testing. However, the big surprise I got is that as the visuals or the you know by looking at the cooler itself i thought you're actually getting way better cooling performance out of the deep cool here and it's the same price as the uh, basically cooler master if you see there's almost a delta of 10 degrees lower doesn't it might not seem like a lot but trust me basically you know you're seeing the deltas but what that means is that with the ryzen and the hyper t2 i was in the low 80s when i was running uh, ida 64 which is a temperature i'm not necessarily comfortable running 24 7. of course you're not going to be under that type of low 24 7 but nonetheless it's temperatures that are getting pretty high while with the deep cool you're in the low 70s which is a temperature i would be comfortable running 24 7 if i had to and it also gives you that extra 10 degrees of, of wiggle room if you see in the charts, uh, I overclocked to 3.7 and I really wouldn't, didn't feel comfortable going any higher with 
either of these two coolers that I would have actually maybe gone to 3.8 or 3.9 with slightly higher voltage if I could have with the deep cool. So for $20 investment, you're actually getting a better performance. And this is a worthy buy in my opinion. Uh, of course, you'd have to compare every, every budget cooler one after the other to know which actually give better performance or which give, give lesser performance. But overall, if you guys are um, not, you know, you just bought a motherboard, you just bought a CPU, you maybe don't have the budget to drop $50 to $100 on an aftermarket cooler with a higher performance. Uh, you know, it's not a bad buy. If you got 10, 20 bucks lying around, deep cool, and you'll be able to push it pretty much probably to the max of 3.8, 3.9, which is what I hit with my 1700. And uh, you'll have a decent cooler on your hands. Um, and overall as well, another good thing to, to sort of note is that uh, basically, Budget-wise, if let's just imagine you did drop that money on the motherboard on the CPU, uh, and you're waiting, you want to buy an all-in-one or you want to buy a high-end cooler, but you don't have the money right now. Well, you're not going to drop forty dollars on a Hyper T, like a Hyper T two, uh, sorry, not a Hyper T two, a uh, Evo two twelve to just throw it in the garbage like three months down the road when you're going to have the money for your better cooler. But you might not. It might not bother you to drop 10 or 15 bucks on a deep cool so that while you're waiting to get that extra hundred or whatnot money, you can actually, you know, in between already overclock your CPU pretty high and really be satisfied later on once you buy your high end cooler. So basically the point of this anal analysis is number one, you're getting a decent product with the base cooler. You don't have to be worried about running and overclocking your CPU gently. And however, at the same time, the surprise that came out of this test, because I wasn't expecting it, is I found a really budget cooler for about 10 to 15 bucks that can actually overclock really decently. So I'm gonna leave the link down below to all of these uh, products, to the, the Hyper T2 and the Deep Cool. Um, as well, just as on a final note, we're gonna look at the uh, sound levels that we were getting from the, CB, from the different coolers. And there again, um, the deep cool and the AMD uh, stock cooler this time were almost identical in, in sound. Like there's a couple of decibels as you can see in the chart, but to the human ear, it wasn't really audible between the two. You're getting pretty silent, even at 100% fan speed uh, coolers. However, the Cooler Master Hyper T2 was like a leaf blower. It was really unpleasant having it run at 100% and I would never run it at 100% in my system just because even with a head gaming headset on, I could still hear it running in the background, which to me is would be unbearable on the, for, for long gaming sessions. So um, honestly, you're getting the same performance with the Ryzen, meaning that honestly, you've knocked the products like the Hyper T2 out of the market for uh, Ryzen owners. Of course, unless you have a, a, a maybe the right the rate stealth the rate stealth then maybe you're going to be getting a little bit lower performance but once again there's other videos looking at that and i'll try to get one on hand so we can actually compare the performance between the rate spire and the rate stealth which is the one that comes with the r5 fit 1400 uh, which is a smaller version of the spire cooler so i hope you guys like the video leave comments down below any questions anything you would want to know leave them in the comments as well uh, drop me a like if you liked the video, it really helps a lot, and uh, I'll see you again next time.